Now, let's get back to that top story. The Justice Secretary has launched an urgent investigation into prison security following a damning report by an undercover reporter from The Times. Head of investigations at The Times, Paul Morgan Bentley, was hired by HMP Bedford, where he worked for eight days <coughs> amid a nationwide staffing shortage. During his time there, he noted a severe lack of security measures, including the absence of basic searches and vetting procedures for new hires. Uh, well, we'll hear from him in a minute. He also revealed that prisoners openly smoked drugs in their cells and dangerous tools, including knives, were left around the prison as construction workers were not being searched properly. Well, joining us in the studio is great friend of Crosstalk, former Mets police detective Peter Blexley, and we can also speak to former Home Office Minister Norman Baker. Norman, I'm going to start with you. I mean, you know, I, I think everyone thought we've got problems in our prisons. We've heard about uh, extremism taking over whole swathes of prisons. Of course, there was that big, that, that the big story when that guy got out of, was it Wormwood well, Scrubs? Wandsworth, Wandsworth. Wandsworth Prison, that's it, and spent a few days just wandering around London before he was found again. Um, we've heard of all sorts of counterfeit goods getting in and out of prisons. But this report, I mean, this is a guy who was head of investigations at the Times. A quick Google of his name would have shown that. So there's been clearly no background checks on him before he was given this job. And he says that doors were left open to the extent that one inmate sort of looked out his cell one day, saw the daylight in the distance and just walked straight towards it and out into the street. I mean, this is crazy. It is crazy, and it's a very, very worrying report. And the fact of the matter is, although very few prison escapes happen, uh, there's a great deal of worry, a uh, very great deal of worry about um, information being uh, smuggled into prisons, and uh, which is unhelpful to the prison authorities, but also, of course, weapons and drugs. I mean, drug use in our prisons is now endemic, uh, and it really ought to be stopped. And there needs to be a, a, a thorough search, really, of people going in and out of prison whoever they are. And I have to say, some of the drugs come in from prison staff themselves, who also need to be searched. Uh, still with us, thanks, Norma, so we are. Uh, still with us is Peter Blexi. Before I come to you, Peter, uh, let's have a listen uh, to Paul Morgan Bentley, who took to making a daily video uh, of her, his time at Bedford Prison, and uh, it makes very uncomfortable listening. Uh, take it away, Paul. The prison has airport-style security on the front gate which should mean that everyone entering is searched thoroughly for contraband including drugs and weapons. However, when I arrived for my shifts, I found this was often not happening. I decided to keep a video diary. This morning I arrived at the prison. There was literally no one on security. There was that one OSG at reception, showed her my ID, and then I walked through. Uh, this was Rega, apparently, you know, he's, as an assistant uh, uh, prison guard, he's not supposed to associate with prisoners. This is a Category B prison, very serious criminals in there, murderers, rapists, etc. Uh, he found himself within 10 minutes chatting to a bunch of them. Uh, he said there's no security checks, therefore, had he have had drugs, he could have passed anything to these uh, lags and so on and so forth. And as uh, Alex said, uh, he was warned on day one uh, where he was hired without security checks on who the hell he was. He was warned on day one. One of the problems with this prison is we have a pandemic of unlocked doors. Now, as a former Met detective, uh, <coughs> when you dispatched your various criminals that you'd caught and had convicted to jail, you thought that they'd be safely locked up. I mean, apart from anything else, learning about this must be very depressing for hard-working coppers, you know, whose work ends with, with crooks being sent to a sort of place like this. Many moons ago, I went to Bedford Prison a lot because it used to house all the super classes for the London area. So people that were very much wanted by other criminals, shall we say, and had to be kept very securely. Um, I'm just so grateful that there are media outlets still funding journalism like this yeah. that can expose this wrongdoing. You know, hats off to The Times and to Paul Morgan Bentley for some great work. He worked as an operational support grade, so an OSG, employed through an agency, so not directly by the prison service. So there's loads of flaws there in terms of vetting, recruitment. We've heard about the lamentable training. 
And if anybody wants to read his full story, go on to the times.co.uk and read it in full. It is absolutely shocking. And it's just yet another symptom of broken Britain. And I don't hesitate to use that expression. So much of our critical infrastructure, what makes this nation what it used to be, is just not working. It's failing. It's failing the prisons, the courts, the police officers, and, of course, victims of crime who expect the bad people to be locked up securely, safely, and for the amount of time they should be. Uh, let's go back to Norman Baker, the former Home Office Minister Norman. I mean, what is behind all of this? We were speaking to someone earlier who said, well, it's a combination of things. There is underfunding, under-resourcing. We hear that all the time with everything in the public sector, whether it's the NHS or education or whatever. You know, it's not getting enough money, uh, despite us paying more tax than ever before. Um, but mm. he also suggested that we kind of need fewer prisoners and that prisoners shouldn't be automatically recalled if they just break the terms of their bail. And, and find themselves occupying prison cells when we've got about 88,000 odd on the entire estate and about 100 left free. Uh, and then we also heard that there were supposed to be new super prisons being built. And well, I don't know, Kevin's been waiting for that for a long time and hasn't seen a single one appear. Then we also learned that about one in nine convicts are foreign born and probably shouldn't even be being held at his majesty's pleasure anyway. As someone who worked in the home office, where's it all gone wrong? What's going on? Is there a quick fix well i mean look society is breaking down to some degree and what we took for granted is what used to work in this country no longer works i mean whether it's a prison or what's the number of potholes in the road i mean britain is a bit is a, is a bit of a shambles to be perfectly frank look i mean the issues you raise are all relevant to uh, how the prison operates but that's no excuse for what's happened at bedford um, there's no reason even if we got shortage of money which we have got a shortage of money in the in the prison service and in the courts in particular that's no excuse for security not being tight at our prisons. It's no excuse for doors being left unlocked. It's no excuse for the fact that drugs and guns can be smuggled into the prison. That's not a fun, that's not a funding issue. That's an operational issue. And those who are responsible for the operation of this prison need to be held to account for the lax arrangements here. Um, Peter, I mean, in the end, a justice system, uh, you know, it has to be punitive. Uh, so the British justice system should revolve around punishment, obviously. Uh, if prisons don't offer proper punishment, then you've got a whole justice system uh, which is built on sand. I mean, we are, our British justice is at stake here, isn't it? Oh, without a doubt. But where we look across the entire criminal justice system, it's, a, a, it's, it's breaking down. The police, the uniformed police now, what are they? They're uniformed social workers. Police service. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they are so, so much uniformed social workers. It's not a crime prevention and detecting organisation now. And you can say that across almost the entire length and breadth of the nation. Look at the Crown Prosecution Service, forever in dispute with the police. Both those organisations complaining about IT. The Crown Prosecution Service actually send back a lot of files to the police because the files are lamentable. The evidence isn't there. We could go on to the courts, some of them crumbling. IT, again, not working. Then we go to the prisons. We're hearing all about that today. Then we go to probation. Once privatised, failed completely, taken back now under the national banner and still not performing as it should do. What is wrong with the infrastructure and the public services in this country? I personally feel that the nation has got so downhearted, so gloomy, that people are not actually pulling their weight. People go to work now in the public sector for as much as they can get out of it, not as much as they can give to the nation. If they, if they go to work at all, most of them uh, campaign to constantly work at home. Uh, Norman, coming back to you, I mean, what Peter's just said is reflective of what you said, which is quite refreshing, because every time we ask about what's gone wrong with the country, all we normally hear is underfunding, 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 and not mm. about, well, actually, this is people just not doing their jobs properly. So if we've got some sort of epidemic of people not doing their job properly, you're a prison officer who doesn't lock the blimmin' doors, what are we <laughs> supposed to do about that? Well, I mean, look, this, this comes from the top, to be perfectly frank with you, and there's a lack of confidence now in the structures of society which used to inspire confidence in this country, uh, whether it's in, in particular in politicians, I have to say. And it goes back to uh, MPs' expenses, if you want to put it there. And that's something I exposed when I was an MP. 
Um, that lost confidence in the politicians. We've seen the Prime Minister Boris Johnson and his mates living it up during COVID, when everybody else was being told to follow the rules. And people look at what happens from those at the top of society. And if they don't behave themselves and behave properly and undertake their jobs properly, then people feel, why should we? And it's a cancer that's running through society, I'm afraid. Uh, let me ask you another question, Norman. Uh, you know, I'm the last, I mentioned this earlier, I'm the last person to call for public sector workers to get uh, more money. Uh, but I do think we have to look at prison officers in a special light uh, because clearly this profession is falling apart at the seams. Uh, clearly the working conditions and the pay packet is not big enough. It's not good enough. Do Should the government, uh, were you uh, still Home Office Secretary, uh, Minister, would you be looking at in some way trying to make the job package of a prison officer more attractive so we could cure our chronic staff shortage problem? There are a number of problems with public sector pay, as a matter of fact. The prison service has certainly got those problems. Uh, they belong elsewhere as well, as a matter of fact, in the public sector. Not everybody in the public sector, but quite a few people now feel, I mean, downtrodden. Um, so the deal with the prison officers should be this. There should be sufficient numbers of prison officers to do their job properly. They should be properly paid and have proper terms and conditions. But there should also be a strict regime, whereas if they betray that trust and are found to be bringing in contraband, telephones and drugs to prisoners, and I'm afraid some of them do, they should be treated very harshly indeed. That's the deal we've got to have. Norman, thank you ever so much. Peter, we were discussing earlier on in the first hour of this programme, I was sort of using a, you know, an anecdote from when I was growing up and uh, working in pubs and bars. And I knew a guy who used to work on the door and he was in and out of prison all the time. And he would deliberately go and commit an offence so he could go back to prison because he found life outside kind of unstructured. Um, and inside there were his mates, there were his drugs, there was his television. There was someone else I knew when I moved to a different part of the country who said the same thing. They'd been in prison for a brief time. He said, yeah, it's great. We just, you know, smoked weed and played computer games. Is that also a problem, do you think, in your experience? That actually, there's a lot of people who don't mind being in prison and don't mind reoffending to go in there, especially if it's like the old travel in there in Bedford. There will always be an element of that. Going way back to when I was a rookie PC in uniform, I would find people that would deliberately go and break windows to, in, in order to try and burgle a shop on Christmas Eve because they preferred Christmas inside rather than outside. Yeah. But they are a relatively small proportion. Overwhelmingly, the majority of people that I sent to prison and have met in prison did not want to spend one more day inside there. Because at the end of the day, prisons are, generally speaking, a pretty unpleasant place to be. There's a continual air or threat of violence and the such like. And they're not the holiday camps that some people would have you believe. OK, the open prisons have a lot more relaxed regime. And there's a world of difference between a cat A and a cat D. That said, I thoroughly agree with so much of what Norman Baker says. You know, when we look at the political classes in this country, so many of whom are clearly in it for their own ends, mm. then is it any surprise that a civil servant, a lowly civil servant, a brand new police officer, a brand new prison officer thinks to themselves, I'm going to get everything I can out of this position rather than thinking I'm going to give it everything I've got? Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's the point, isn't it? I mean... It's all very well to say we've got terrible staff shortages, but surely uh, prison officers could sort of do the basics like lock the doors. The fact that they're not doing that uh, says to me that you've got a very disillusioned staff, probably very depleted, who've stopped caring. That's mm. the problem here. Absolutely. And the harsh reality now is, and this is truly ludicrous, if you join the prison service, say at 18, mm. in all likelihood, you've probably got to work as a frontline prison officer for 50 years, yes, 50 years, to get a full pension, which is utter yeah. lunacy. Got to get them Who's a better gonna deal. Who's going to do that? You've got to get them a better no. deal. Uh, and I'm, as I say, I can't believe I'm saying it, but we've got to cure this problem somehow. And we have to make that job more attractive. Simple as that. Mm. Peter, thank you ever so much. And thanks, of course, to, to Norman Baker.